Hello, uh, my name is Doug Kuhn, and today we are going to be talking about some maps. Um, but uh, before I get started, I sort of want to take a trip back in time. Um, I'll be going over seven different projects, but to start, this is a photo of me when I was um, about seven or eight years old, uh, and I'm holding up a drawing that I had made. This is of Yosemite. It's hard to see the actual photo, but, but we had taken a family trip to Yosemite, and I was drawing basically everything I saw. Um, when I was a kid, I loved to draw. I was just drawing all the time. I grew up in a very artistic household. Uh, my mother was a painter. She would do watercolors. And so as I was growing up, um, art was always in our house. Um, and art was a real passion of mine for a long time, from when I was a little kid all the way up through high school. And then when I went off to college, um, the process of creating art sort of started slipping away from me. Um, not really intentionally, it just sort of got displaced. Um, you know, in college I discovered computer programming. I had been sort of dabbling in programming um, before that, but, but really realized that this was a passion of mine. Um, and that sort of took its place. And, um, you know, when I was, but, but back when I was a kid, you know, when I was eight years old, I was asked in elementary school, to write down where I thought I would be uh, and what I would be doing when I grew up. And I wrote that I was gonna be living in Hawaii and I was gonna be an artist. Um, now we all know that sort of the dreams of an eight-year-old rarely turn into reality, right? Otherwise we'd all know a whole bunch of astronauts. But, um, you know, I, I did end up living near a beach. Uh, I didn't make it to Hawaii. Uh, my beach is quite cold, but I live in San Francisco. And I've become a bit obsessed with, with my city. You'll see a lot of maps of San Francisco. Um, and it's interesting, I, I don't really feel like I ever picked San Francisco. San Francisco just sort of happened to me. Um, and that's the case for a lot of things in my life. Um, the things that I'm, I've sort of become passionate about, they were never intentional decisions, really. I just either stumbled into something or, or got pulled into something. And, and San Francisco is similar. I was in the Bay Area for college, and, and after college, ended up just sort of feeling this gravitational pull towards the city, and ended up there. While I was in San Francisco, um, I also stumbled into another passion of mine, which is mapping. This is the first uh, mapping application I ever created. I was working for a software consulting company, and just randomly got assigned to a consulting gig that was a map app. This was just a little dinky thing. It was, um, this is for trying to map photos that you take along a hike. Um, but uh, I, after this project, I ended up, again, completely randomly being involved in a couple other mapping projects. And I started feeling that same sort of gravitational pull that was sucking me in. Um, and I got fairly obsessed with maps. Um, after, after a couple of consulting gigs, we realized that there was really something here, and, and I helped start a, a mapping startup called Spatial Key. This is what I do today. Um, this is sort of my day job. We take large amounts of geo data, and we do sort of interesting things with it, whether that's showing a heat map, or um, looking at Hurricane Sandy approaching the East Coast, or in this case, this is crime data in San Francisco. Um, and so I started just becoming completely obsessed, again, uh, with mapping. And this is what I've been doing for the past five years. Um, you know, I'm sort of just a programmer who, who loves working with maps. But I started getting really bored. Um, and not bored with maps, and not bored with even the work um, or my job, but I started getting bored just with this screen. We do all of our work on these screens, and we sit in front of these computers, and we look at screens all day long. It started feeling like, I was constrained, I was stuck, I was locked within the screen. And whether it's this screen or it's the screen in our, on our phone or the screen on a tablet, it, it just felt so constricting. And I felt the need to break out of that. Um, I wanted to, to create something real again, something that wasn't just pixels on a screen. And then more sort of fundamentally, I wanted to be this kid again. Um, if you look at this, the smile on my face here. That's not a smile of amusement or of joy. This is just a smile of pride. I'm incredibly proud of what I was creating you know, with my own hands. 
And so I wanted to get back that feeling a little bit. And so I, I knew I wanted to make things. Um, I wanted to, to make something real that I could hold, something tangible. The good news is that um, now is a fantastic time in uh, the history of the world to be a maker. There are incredible options. Um, it seems like you know every week you read about a new 3D printer coming out. Uh, there are services that you can use if you don't want to invest in your own hardware. Uh, Shapeways and Pinoco are two different services. You can do 3D printing as well as laser cutting. And then of course there's you know all the machines that you can do uh, that you can use for do-it-yourself um, stuff. I'm going to be focusing on just a couple of these things, um, two two services, and then uh, I have I, I've ended up purchasing a 3D printer. Um, I have the Athenia uh, 3D printer, but there's so many options in a wide range of price points. If you're at all interested in sort of dabbling in this stuff, I highly recommend um, taking the plunge and, and buying a 3D printer. You know, these things are small, they, they can sit on your desk, although you have to be a little careful of the fumes. Um, and uh, it, it's an incredible amount of fun. And so with the exception of one of the pieces that I'm about to show, um, everything else uh, in this presentation was made using some variety of, of these services. And so I'll start with, with the first project, which relates to something that I do for work. Um, and for work we make uh, software that lets companies respond to natural disasters. So whether that's an earthquake or flooding or wildfires or obviously hurricanes. And so We've been working on software for a few years, and last year was a very busy year for us um, as Hurricane Sandy was approaching the East Coast. Um, and I was sitting in California, and I was watching this event unfold. And I was, literally I was like on the edge of my seat. Um, well, I was on the edge of my seat every six hours, because that's sort of how often the forecasts get updated. And so I would watch these forecasts come in, and, and I would load up all the new data, and I, sort of was watching the storm as it morphed, and I was watching it so closely that the shape of this thing just started being ingrained in my head. It was like it had entered my subconscious. It was sort of like a, a Rorschach test of, of ink blots, right? I, I started seeing these things. This is Irene, and then we've got, uh, in the middle there, this is Isaac, and then Sandy. I just, I started seeing these things everywhere. Um, I was out to dinner with my wife one night, and. We are at an Italian place and a drop of olive oil fell and stained the tablecloth and instantly I pull out my phone and I looked like a crazy person because I was taking this photo of this, but I saw hurricanes. Um, you know, I was like one of those crazy people who sees Jesus in toast. They were literally, it was just like, they were everywhere. They were, they were in my head. And so I wanted to take these things that were so present in my mind and, and just get them out. Um, and so I figured what better way to do that than to create something that was going to be always present in my home as well. So I created this um, set of coasters. These are made out of wood, uh, two different types of bamboo. And I used uh, Pinoco, which is uh, the service you can upload a design and they will use their laser cutters and cut it all out. Um, and you can cut things out of uh, wood. They can do engraving in metal, you can cut out a plastic, all sorts of, of cool materials. And so these are all to scale. Um, again, you've got Irene, Sandy, Isaac. Um, they're all to scale and sort of uh, all oriented the same way. So you can put them next to each other, you can compare how big, for instance, Sandy was a really wide storm that was a thousand miles wide, um, compared to Irene, which was the year prior. Um, and you can see that there, there's sort of a big difference there. This is one of the uh, designs that I ended up sending off. So this is just an example of, of what you do to create laser cut designs. The blue lines indicate, uh, they tell the laser to cut all the way through. And then you also have different levels of engraving. And so the pink there is, is telling the laser to engrave. And then what you get back in the mail, uh, once you send that off, you have to wait a couple weeks and then you get this package. And Pinocchio is kind of funny. They, send, they put this big yippee sticker on all of their packages. Um, and I went on a bit of a laser cutting spree. Uh, it seemed like every week or so I had a new package showing up. And this is actually a fairly accurate sticker because I did, I was filled with like the sense of glee every time I had one of these sitting on my doorstep. It was like Christmas every week. This is a shot of just the assembly and process. So you get this package and it's got all these laser cut parts. Um, and then 
I went about the process of assembling them. So I mentioned you know, two different types of bamboo were used here. So we've got a light shade and a dark shade. And then um, I put it all together by hand. I also uh, cut out cork. So you, cork board is another material that you can, you can use. And uh, that was the base. And then super glued all of it together. So here's just a shot of these uh, sitting on my coffee table. Um, and a close-up of, of just one of them, this is Irene. You can sort of see some of the, the detail in, in the cuts and, and the engraving. And this is uh, Hurricane Sandy, which is probably the most familiar um, in people's minds. And so I really liked the idea of taking something massive, something so big, right? We're talking, you know, this is a thousand miles across here. Taking something so big and just shrinking it down um, you know, sort of like a, a giant game of playing with shrinky dinks, right? Um, bringing it down to this coaster scale. And you know, Hurricane Sandy was this massive force of nature, right? A thousand miles wide. Um, you know, in its path, it left 285 people dead. It was this huge, huge force of nature. And, you know, we, we try to stay on top of understanding these things. We, we watch them on the news, we, we look at all the data, and we think that we sort of comprehend what, what this really means, but we don't, right? There's no way that we can really wrap our head around that. Um, and so, you know, the, this idea that, that this massive, very difficult to understand thing is now being brought down to this tiny sort of lightweight scale, there's sort of a dystopian uh, cognitive dissonance in that that I, I really like. I'm going to now move on to the, the second project here, which is um, along a similar theme, at least sticking with, with natural disasters. Um, I mentioned that we also do work with hurricane, uh, or sorry, with earthquake data. Um, and so if we're talking about earthquakes, uh, the, one of the more recent uh, ones in, in people's heads is going to be the earthquake in Haiti. This was a magnitude 7 earthquake, January 2010. This was a huge event. Um, you know, everyone remembers watching on the news, I'm sure. Uh, estimates of anywhere from 80,000 to upwards of 300,000 people killed. Uh, it's kind of crazy that even this many years later, no one really knows the real death toll from this event. This is the USGS map. Um, you can see the epicenter right near Port-au-Prince. And I'm sure everyone sort of remembers seeing some of these images on the news as we watched and you know, trying to dig out people from the rubble. This is the data for the shake intensities. and so. You can sort of look at this, and, and these are contour lines that indicate how heavy the shaking was at different locations. And you can sort of feel this ripple out from the center there. And so I was sitting at my computer, and I was looking at, at this image in particular, and I was struck by, by sort of the pattern here. And if you take away the whole map and everything, this is just the raw data there. I was struck with this association that you might be making right now as well. Um, this, to me, look just like the rings of a tree. Um, and I don't want to trivialize the Haiti earthquake, right? You know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives were lost. But there was something oddly fascinating about thinking about this, this one natural event that has horrific consequences, right? This earthquake. And then this other natural event that universally we think of as beautiful and um, sort of sustaining life on this planet. And yet, both of those are just nature running its course. Um, and to me, there was something beautiful thinking about that, that, that we have something horrible and something beautiful. But deep down, they're sort of the same natural process. So I wanted to create something that tried to connect those dots. So this is the design that I shipped off to Pinoco. Um, again, it's just the raw data. Um, I didn't do anything to change the data. It's exactly the data that I got um, for the earthquake. And then this is the, the piece that I created. So this is hanging on my wall. It's made out of um, two different types of wood. And you can see um, sort of where the laser was cut. And then also uh, the inner parts is all engraved. And so I was trying to evoke that same type of beauty that we get when looking at a tree trunk. That same sort of natural process that's involved here. 
Um, you can see some of the details of, of the cuts and the engraving. So this is hanging on my wall at home, and to me it serves as a reminder. Um, it's a reminder that sometimes there's not that much difference between something horrible and something beautiful. You know, deep down it was the same natural processes that were responsible both for a massive loss of life and the destruction in Haiti, as well as the growth of this planet. And, you know, for better or worse, those things are completely outside of our control. And to me, there's a, cer a certain sense of beauty um, in that. I'm going to shift gears um, when talking about the next project and touch on 3D printing. Um, a few years ago, I created a set of maps uh, for San Francisco that show crime, different crime types and the density of those crimes in the city. And I, I created 3D models of San Francisco to show uh, mountain peaks where the crime was, was the greatest. And I took that a step further um, and I turned those into uh, fridge magnets. So I use a 3D printing service, uh, Shapeways, where you upload your model and then they print it out using a variety of printers. They have really good stuff. Um, you can print out of plastic, you can print out of ceramics, um, metal, all sorts of cool materials. Um, Shapeways does a, a great job. It's a fantastic service. The quality is much better than you're gonna get when doing sort of home printing stuff. Um, but the problem with, with using Shapeways is that it gets real expensive real fast. And so they charge simply based on volume. So the bigger your model, the more expensive. And trying to print large things gets really prohibitively expensive and it's hard to sort of justify because you also don't know whether it's going to turn out quite right um, and so it's hard to justify spending hundreds of dollars on you know sort of a model um, that's of reasonable size and so I took the plunge um, and I bought my own 3D printer so this is the one that I ended up purchasing um, this one costs sixteen hundred dollars um, but there are other there's so many options these days um, it really does seem like new ones come out every week uh, the options sort of range in price anywhere from like 500 bucks to sort of around 2,500 um, is the general range for, for the home printers. Um, so I ended up purchasing this one and now that I have my own 3D printer, uh, once you sink that initial investment in, then you're just stuck buying more plastic. And so the plastic comes in these rolls. Um, each roll costs about 35 bucks and you can actually print a lot of shit with just one of these uh, sort of reams of plastic. And so I, the first thing I, I decided to do was take those same models and just try to sort of biggie size them. Um, and so this was my first attempt, just seeing you know, what would happen if I, I tried to print these things larger. Um, but the, the printer that I have, the build area is, it's a five by five by five cube. That's sort of the max size that you can build. Other printers have larger sizes, but, but the one that I have is five by five by five. Um, and so what I wanted to do is see what would happen if I pushed that to the limits here. Um, and this is, this is one of those results. Um, these are what I'm calling my stalagmite crime maps, I hope for obvious reasons. This is uh, narcotics crimes in San Francisco. And so I took these peaks and tried to stretch them just as far as I could. Uh, this is essentially five inches high because that's the highest I could go. And the result is this sort of exponentially multiplied intensity. You know, from like a data viz perspective or uh, accuracy perspective, these aren't the best maps, but from sort of an emotional artistic perspective, I really like this, the look that, that ended up coming out of this. This is uh, prostitution, and prostitution is interesting in San Francisco, at least the prostitution arrests, they're very heavily concentrated just along a couple streets in San Francisco, so you end up with sort of these, these blades of a knife almost jutting out here. Um, I thought about trying to bring some of these maps uh, here, but I didn't think I would get this through security. Um, it's actually fairly dangerous. This is assault, um, and so you start seeing uh, there's a lot of places in San Francisco that you can get mugged or punched in the face. Uh, assault crimes are, are generally more dispersed, although you do see um, you know, there is still uh, relative peaks. That's the Tenderloin uh, in San Francisco, by the way. Um, just in case you're, you're visiting in the future, you know where to be on guard. And then here's vehicle theft. Now, vehicle theft is just everywhere, right? Like, cars get stolen all throughout the city. And I really liked how this one turned out. It sort of um, 
to me, it, it looks like you're peering into this underground cave. Here's sort of a, a head-on shot of this one to, to gaze into the abyss of, of uh, crime in San Francisco. And here's a, a full shot um, of all four maps. And so because I had this, um, you know, after my initial investment in the printer, because I now had this relatively cheap 3D printing capability, I was able to just sort of experiment with these forms. Um, you know, and any one of these individual maps would have been too expensive for me to sort of justify in my mind printing using Shapeways. But now that I could print them, and, and you know, my printer just sits on my desk at home, um, and so I, I wake up in the morning and I go to work, and I'll often just like kick off a print. Some of these take a long time. The vehicle theft one is so much plastic. That one took 18 hours um, to print. But I just sort of kick it off and let it run throughout the day, and it's, it's always a fun way to end the day to see, see what ends up coming out. Now, the only problem with these maps is I don't know where I can put them in my house. Um, the peaks are actually really, really sharp. And so uh, my wife is worried that if I mount them on the wall, which was going to be my original plan, that a guest would come over and potentially impale themselves. And <laughs> you certainly don't want a guest impaling themselves on the prostitution peaks. <laughs> but OK, so I'm going to move on to another project. You know, enough about horrible things like, uh, like death and, and prostitution and drugs. Um, I'm going to move on to something lighter, something cuter. Uh, this is my son, who is cute as hell. He's um, about a year and a half old, and he always gets all the coolest toys. Um, and you know, my wife goes out, she'll go shopping, she'll come back, and she's got some new toy. And sometimes um, I get a little jealous. You know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that I get jealous of a one and a half year old. She, um, she came back one day, and, and she had gotten him this toy, which is uh, a corkboard map. She knows that I love maps. And, and so um, this is a map that you can you know, put on your kid's wall. And then you can use pins and, and place pins around and you know, teach them about geography, about you, know, you live here and your family is from here and, and all that. So I thought this was really cool. Um, I got a little bit jealous. Uh, didn't want my kid to have a cooler toy than, than I have. So I went about making my own uh, version. But of course, since I'm obsessed with San Francisco, I wanted a San Francisco corkboard map. Um, this is the design that I sent off for laser cutting. And I had to split it up into two pieces because I wanted a big map. One of the rules was my map had to be bigger than my son's. Um, <laughs> and so I wanted a really big cork board that I could, I could put up on my wall. So I, I sent that off and then this is the, the result mounted on my wall after I got it back and, and put it together. And so you have a very general outline of, of San Francisco and then engraved in there are sort of a very simplified version of the streets of San Francisco so that I can get oriented and, and um, you know, sort of know where to place things. Just a close up of some of the streets that is centered um, right near my house. And so obviously the, the first thing I did once I got this up on the wall was started placing some pins. Um, and you know, it's funny. I started working with maps all digitally, right? So I've placed tons of digital pins on digital maps, but I actually haven't had experience working with real maps and placing real pins. And you know, it's funny to, to see the aesthetic that ends up making its way onto our screens, you know, all these little pin markers that, that get dropped on digital maps, and to see that sort of actually recreated with the real thing. And so the, the first map that I made was influenced by my son. Um, this is the locations of all the public libraries in San Francisco. So uh, my son frequents this one right there. Uh, he goes there all the time. And I figured this is sort of a cool way to teach him about, about his city, about where he lives, where he goes. Um, he's a little bit young now to really know what the hell I'm talking about when I point at things on maps. But I figure it's never too young to, to start exposing him um, to this type of stuff. The next map I did was, was along a similar vein. Um, and this is the locations of all the public elementary schools in the city. And if you ask any parents in San Francisco, they will tell you that the public school system is a mess of a system and very, very difficult to navigate and completely anxiety provoking. Um, it's sort of a lottery system. You never really know where your kid's going to get in, whether they're going to get into a good school or a bad school, or whether you're going to have to ship them across the city to a different school. Um, and so this is something that we're going to be dealing with as my son grows up. Um, and this was sort of my way of, of beginning to wrap my head around this complicated system. 
But I was, sort of, I was looking at you know, all these points, and I was thinking, you know, there's got to be something more interesting, a, a more interesting visual treatment I could do here. And in some of my mapping research, um, I came across this method called Delaunay triangulation. And this method connects all points together, and it creates triangles between all the points. This is often used for uh, like 3D modeling purposes or terrain generation. And so I wanted to take that same method and apply it to these elementary school points. And so the, the result, um, I went down to sort of the craft store and I bought um, red yarn and went about the meticulous process of just connecting everything by hand. And this is the, the result of that. And this isn't really any more about you know, understanding the system. It's, it's just sort of a piece of generative art. I, it sort of represents to me anyway the, the complexity of this system, the, the web of anxiety that, that plagues all parents in San Francisco. Um, and I just sort of liked the, the tactile feel um, that came out of this. This is it just hanging on my wall to get sort of a sense of, of scale. And then a couple close-ups here to see uh, the, the yarn wrapped around the pins. And you start really, you can, you can almost feel um, the tactile nature. And, you know, again, I'd, been, I'd spent so much time working with digital maps, you know, and drawing polygons and drawing lines and, and placing points on maps, that it was fun to, to play with something that I could hold and to recreate all those same things that I do digitally, but, but in a physical form. This is just one last shot of um, when I was taking this apart, this particular map. Um, halfway through taking it apart, you can see sort of the yarn hanging there. And I, just, I liked this just because I was really struck by sort of the messiness of the medium, um, which I really enjoyed. Sticking with, with public schools for a second, um, there's uh, a, a nonprofit that scores all the schools in California. I think it, it does the same process for a lot of other states. Um, and mostly it's based on test scores, I think. Um, but they're called great schools, and they give schools a score of, of one to 10, one being bad, 10 being good. Um, and so, you know, as parents, everyone goes and looks at these scores, and I don't know, there's much you can do about it, but, um, but you sort of want to know whether, whether the school in your area is good or not. So I went and took all that data. Um, so this is all the, those same public elementary schools with the associated scores. Um, and I want to try to sort of understand the quality aspect to the school system a little bit. Now, a little side note, um, San Francisco is a, basically a seven mile by seven mile square. It's actually a very small city geographically, at least compared to, to lots of comparable cities. Um, and so, you know, it's not a perfect square, obviously, but, but as residents, we often just think of it as seven by seven. And so I took that seven by seven square and divided it up into a grid. Uh, in this case, it's a 12 by 12 grid, so there's 144 cells here. And then I wanted to, to try to give each cell a score, um, which was sort of a composite score. It was a weighted score that I produced based on um, the, the highest scored school within a cell, but then also the highest scored school in surrounding cells. Um, sort of the general concept being that, you know, a good school will influence uh, the surrounding area as well. And so this is the, the result of doing that uh, weighting. Uh, as the, the color is lighter, that indicates a higher score, and then as the color gets darker here, it indicates lower scores, or potentially just no schools, right? The areas in the corners just don't have any public schools. So I wanted to do something with this. I want to turn this into a, a physical thing, and I settled on um, wood. I wanted to, to create something with wood. So I went over to Home Depot, and I bought a shitload of wood. Um, now, I don't know anything about working with wood. Like, I don't know how to saw wood. I don't know how to sand wood. I, I'm like clueless. So um, I also bought a saw, just a little hand saw, while I was at Home Depot. Um, and this is my makeshift uh, workshop. You can see how horribly inexperienced uh, I am. And I sort of had this romantic notion that sawing all this wood, the general concept was that I was going to create one, one piece of wood per grid square. Um, so 144 pieces of wood. And you know, I had this romantic notion that I would be sitting in, in the garage and I'd be sawing and it'd be sort of like a Zen meditation thing, right? I'd just like get into the zone and put on some headphones and just saw and enjoy my time. Um, and I also just figured like, well, it's 144 cuts, right? Like, that's not that many. Like, how long can it possibly take? And it turns out that sawing 144 pieces of wood by hand is an incredible pain in the ass. 
Um, I do not recommend, I almost broke down and bought a power saw about halfway through, but, but I made it all the way through. Um, I did saw everything by hand. Uh, that's not to say there weren't some mishaps. Um, little note of warning, do not saw under the influence. No good will come of it. <laughs> but I made it through. Um, and so this is, this is all the wood cut up, neatly stacked into the different piles of different sizes. Um, and so the next step was then to paint. So this is my fairly ghetto little workshop in the back, <laughs> uh, in the backyard where I set up my little painting uh, studio, spray painted uh, everything, trying to use sort of primary colors. The general concept was to, to try to match some of the aesthetic of a lot of these wood toys that my son has. And so this is one example of, of one row in that um, grid, and I just glued everything together with wood glue once I had it all painted. And then once I had multiple rows, I started gluing those together um, and sort of assembling this, this map. And so this is the final piece um, sitting in my living room here. Um, you know, it's sort of a very abstract map of San Francisco. So, you know, this is north up here and, and south down here. Um, and so you've got your, your seven by seven square. And in general, it, it, you know, it shows the overall quality of the public schools in our city. Um, and so the, the red and the orange uh, are used for the highest scores. And then, you know, the, the blues and the whites are used for the lowest scores. And so this sort of got me uh, you know, a, a piece that, that tries to convey uh, some of these, the, the quality aspect of the school system. There's just a slightly different angle here. And here's a, here's a close-up shot. You can see the amazing woodworking uh, skills on display. And then just a shot of, of the different colors, uh, the contrast. Now, the coolest thing about this piece, by far, um, I brought it up upstairs once I was finished, and the coolest thing is that my son loves it. Um, so he, he takes all of his toys, he's really into stacking things now, so like stacking everything, right? We got, you know, like little stackable buckets, or uh, he stacks everything, he loves it. And so he takes all of his toys and, and he sort of meticulously goes and, and stacks them on top of this map. And so it's turned into just a sort of playful toy for him, um, which I think is really cool. And you know, as he grows older, um, and we have to deal with the elementary school situation, um, you know, hopefully we'll figure out a way to, to get him to wind up in one of these you know, red areas and not uh, sort of the lower uh, peaks, but uh, we'll sort of have to wait and see. So play a little association game now. Um, when I say elementary schools, what's the first thing that, that comes to mind? Um, sex offenders, right? Maybe my mind's just a little bit fucked up. Um, but if you're a parent uh, in any city, you've all done this, right? You've all gone and Googled, like, where, like where's the sex offender map? I want to see where the sex offenders are that live near me. Like, no good will come of, of learning this information, right? Like, what are you going to do? Nothing. But, like, you're a parent, so you freak out, and, and you go and you, you look at the scary mug shots. Um, well, this is the, the map of all the sex offenders in San Francisco. And... Um, I want to take this data and, and, and I wanted to do something with it. And you know, I talked about Delaunay triangulation. There's a related method called Voronoi, which instead of connecting points, creates polygons around points. And so in this case, there's a unique polygon for each single point. And what ends up happening when you do uh, this method is the points that are close together, uh, you end up with very small polygons because each polygon can only contain one point. And then as the points get spread out, you end up with these larger polygons. And so if you do that with the sex offender data, this is the resulting map. And so you can start seeing some of the areas um, where the polygons are very small, you have all the points very close together. Whereas when they start, the polygons get larger, that means that the points have, have spread out, and so the density isn't as much. And so I sent this off for laser cutting, um, and I, I cut out of acrylic, which is just sort of hard sheets of plastic. And this was uh, the resulting piece, white acrylic uh, mounted, sort of floating above the black background here. And so this is, um, this is hanging on, on my wall at home. And you know, I find it quite beautiful. It's sort of like a, a web over the city. Um, you, know, you, can, you can see where the, the densest areas are, where the shapes got so small, I just combined them together um, so that I didn't have to, to have the laser try to cut that fine. Um, and so you start seeing these clumps of white forming where 
the, the highest density areas are. It's just a, a, a shot from the side to try to capture the, the 3D nature of this, how it's mounted, floating above the background. And just one, one final shot here. And I really like how this turned out. Um, and the, the best part is probably that, you know, I have this on my wall. It's just sort of like a piece of abstract art almost. Um, but the best part is, you know, we'll have guests over. And they'll be just walking around, looking at stuff on the wall. Or and they're like, oh, that's, that's cool. Um, yeah, what's that? And I get to always say, oh, yeah, you're looking at sex offenders, which is sort of a, a fun thing to be able to do. <laughs> And I don't know, I'm a little fucked. <laughs> Sticking with, with some messed up topics, just for, um, for a second, this will be the, the last piece that I'll show off here. Um, this is where all the murders are, uh, were in San Francisco for the last two years. So this is two years of murders, 2011 and 2012. Um, and you know, again, as a resident of any city, um, you always pay attention when you know, there's, a, there's a murder in the news, um, and, or, and maybe people don't do this, but I always like go and look at the maps of where things are. Um, and so I wanted to take this data um, and, and try to do something, uh, sort of transform it a bit uh, more artistically. And so I did the, the same process of generating this Voronoi diagram. Um, and so here you can see you know, where the, the polygons get, get very small. Um, you've got clusters of homicides. Um, versus where they spread out more, uh, the polygons get larger. And I was looking at this, and visually, I was sort of struck. Um, and to me, it reminded me of, of stained glass, just sort of this look of, of how the pieces all fit together. And so I wanted to try to, to replicate uh, and, and sort of emulate some of that stained glass look. Um, so I, I sent off two designs for laser cutting, one to get cut out of black plastic um, and one to get cut out of multiple colors, uh, so sort of semi-transparent colored plastic. And this is uh, in the process of putting that together. You can see a couple of the colors. I've got blue, red, um, orange. And so I started this process of sort of assembling this mosaic. And um, I wanted to figure out how to glue this together. And you know, my naive approach would just be go buy some fucking glue and glue it together. Turns out that normal glue will destroy acrylic. It um, sort of has a chemical reaction and it chips and it, it doesn't work at all. Uh, luckily, you know, Google and Amazon to the rescue, there is magic glue that is made just for glue, gluing acrylic called Weld On 16. So with this new tool in hand, I was able to, to assemble this thing. And this is one of the, the resulting pieces here. And so you can see sort of the, the different colors, the, the mosaic fitting together. Um, and again, the areas with the, the smallest shapes, um, the smallest little slices of color there, that's where uh, there are the most murders in the city. And here's just a close up to see, see how the colors sort of fit together. Um, the, the color uh, choices are just semi-random, um, just trying to recreate that stained glass look. And now here's, it, it looks coolest by far when, when light is shining through it. And so this is a shot of it being lit from the back, um, light shining through. And you really start now getting the colors to jump out. And um, you start getting that stained glass look. So here's just another shot of, of light shining through there. And so I want to take this, but, but I want to do something a little bit bigger. Um, and I had all these, uh, I had four sheets of different colors here, and so I had all these other pieces, right? I only used portions of, of that for one of these panels, and so I had all these other pieces. And so what I decided I was going to do is try to put things together into a box. And so the box was going to have um, the same design, but, but uh, four different sides um, using this. And, and luckily, again, Google to the rescue, if you just search for, like, how to make a laser cut box, there's a little app that will help you generate uh, the design files that, that you need. And so once I got all those pieces, I put this together, and this is sort of what I call my pretty little murder box. Um, each side, again, is, is the same map, um, you know, sort of a very abstract map of San Francisco, um, but sort of a different configuration of colors on each side. And this is just another shot where you can sort of see the light shining through there. And then, you know, sort of looking through from one side, you can see the other side there. 
but you know, this, this stained glass stuff, it sort of, it looks coolest always when there's light shining through. So I wanted to take this just one step further. Um, on the bottom of the box, uh, the, the bottom panel, I cut out this hole and then I created a um, sort of a makeshift lamp uh, using a light bulb uh, and then mounted this, the box above this so that the general idea was to try to have light shining out from inside the box. So this is sort of the result um, of that. You can see the, the light pouring out and the light sort of pours out and, and really fills up the room, sort of these colors are, are up on the walls or on the ceiling. Here's just a, a different shot to see some of the different, a, a different sides, some of the different colors. And what's, what's hard to capture here in photos is really what it does to the room. Um, you know, like I said, the walls are just color, covered in these colors, these, these sort of beautiful blue and orange and, and red colors. And it sort of turns the room into like this light painting, uh, which is sort of neat. You know, in general, um, this piece was sort of about taking something, again, sort of taking something horrible and trying to turn it into something beautiful. And so just looking back um, in summary, these are the, the seven projects um, that, that I created. Um, the process of creating this, this, all of these were created in probably about the last five months. Um, they are actually all created because of this conference. Um, this conference was the catalyst for sort of getting me off my ass and, and getting me motivated to begin this, this creative journey. Um, and I'm, I'm planning on continuing sort of exploring this line of work. Um, it was incredibly fulfilling to, to work on these things. Um, and I really hope that this is just sort of the beginning of the rediscovery of my artistic side. You know, because really, I'm just an eight-year-old kid who likes to draw. Um, I don't draw with pen and paper anymore. Um, you know, I draw with, with code and with data, but I want to try to recapture the pride that was in this kid's face. Um, so it's been a privilege, um, you know, being up here and, and being able to share this work with, with you guys. Um, I definitely want to thank John and Nicole. Um, you know, like I said, all these things were created simply because uh, this conference exists and, and is the motivating factor for me. Um, and so thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, and you know, most of all, I just want to thank all of you for indulging me in sort of this journey. Thanks. I guess we could do. No one, no one ever has questions. But does anyone have have questions? Yeah. Have you ever tried having like random acts of kindness or anything like that? Like not horrible things. Yeah, not horrible. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, uh, well, the, the, the school stuff I, was, was a bit in response to, to doing some of that. Um, I, I tweeted a thing about like, uh, when I was working on the Haiti map, and my dad calls me up. Uh, so my dad follows me on Twitter, which is a little bit weird, because I always forget that, and then like, every once in a while that comes back to bite me. Um, and so he calls me up, like right after I tweeted, he's like, that is so fucked up. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, what? It's like, it's not fun to like play with, with something that's so heavy. Like you map, you know, crime and murders and and because I, I had previously been working on like Southern Birthday Sandy. He's like, why can't you map something fun? Um, I don't know. I'm I'm drawn, I'm drawn to certain things, and I don't really know why. Um, the, the school stuff was an attempt to break out of, of trying to not do bad things and try to focus on, on positive things. Um, I don't know why I don't like mapping fun stuff. Um, somehow the, the dark stuff, uh, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I try to touch on in a lot of these pieces is that I really like the, the cognitive dissonance that occurs when you're looking at something beautiful that represents something horrible. Um, and sort of the, you get a sec, like a double take. Uh, your mind has to sort of do a double take when you look at something and you think you know what you're seeing, or even if you don't know what you're seeing, you think you like what you're seeing. And then it turns out when you realize what it is, you actually really don't like it. Um, and I sort of like that, that 
thing that the mental gymnastics that your mind has to do. So, so fun things don't have that same that same thing. Um, but, but yeah, I um, I don't know. I worry about myself a little bit in terms of how much I like snapping the horse.